it's very nice to be back again in, in Luxembourg. I have many fond memories here. It was very nice to go back to the Tulip. That's the hotel that Janet Gornick built. And uh, the Molotar and see the White Rose is still across the street. I spent a lot of time in the White Rose. It's a great Irish bar. Those of you who are Irish and understand Irish bars know that on Saturday morning, kids go in there. And my kid's going to be in there with me on Saturday morning, my four-year-old. So and right around the corner is the Swedish bar. I know that one well, too. But a, a lot of the rest has changed. So it's nice to be here. And I don't want to tarry too long. I want to get started and talk about this topic of inequality and intergenerational mobility. And I want to talk about three different ways of looking at it. So this is what we agreed that the talk would be about. And those of you in the front row got to go like this. I'm sorry. You can turn your head now and there. Or you can look at this one, OK? And so we want to know about how, how these two are related. And they are related, but how exactly they're related, we don't know, because they mutually reinforce one another. And I'll explain that. Um, so the question is, are we more interested in inequality of outcome, Y and W mean income and wealth, Y and W, or inequality of opportunity? And Americans, and I think Europeans, care much more about inequality and opportunity than inequalities and outcomes. In other words, you care, um, Europeans care more about inequality of outcomes than Americans do. But we all care about the fact that we would like a society in which everyone had an equal chance to be successful, and if they worked hard and played by the rules, they would become successful. So that's what we're talking about here. So I'm talking about differences in opportunities to get ahead, but also differences in taking advantage of those opportunities. So what society needs to do, or public policy needs to do, is create opportunities, education, training programs, opportunities for young people to learn and get ahead, and then they have to take advantage of those opportunities. So it takes both things to be successful. And they're important and policy relevant for two different types of mobility. I'm mainly going to talk about relative mobility today, but also I'll bring in absolute mobility. Relative mobility means that where are you in the distribution of outcomes, whether it's education or income or wealth, compared to where your parents were. So. Um, that's relative. And the trouble with relative or the, is if someone goes up, someone else has to go down. Because it's just a ranking from, let's say, 1 to 100 of 100 people. Okay. Absolute mobility, on the other hand, has to do with real levels of living. Are your children going to be economically better off than you are? Now, this is very important. And in the Western world today, we don't have a lot of mobi absolute mobility. So I went to China. And I lectured in China. People, oh, inequality in China is terrible. Well, it's growing like crazy, yes. But then I talked to some people, and I found out that the peasants who were in, outside the big cities were better off today than they were. their parents were under Mao, and they knew their children would be better off because every year their standard of living was rising. Their bicycles were better. They had refrigerators. They could put roofs in their houses. This was really increased. You can tolerate a lot of inequality if all the boats are rising. But when things are flat in the water, or the middle class is not getting ahead and it's declining, then you've got trouble. So that's why absolute mobility is also important. Now, I want to look at intergenerational mobility three ways and connect it to policy. Way one is the way that virtually everyone does it. You go back and you find a set of parents um, somewhere in the past and wait till the kids grow up and see how all the kids did relative to the parents. Uh, the debate there is whether there is a trend in inequality or not, and I can talk about that. Okay, But the issue is, suppose you've got this ladder, this relative ranking, okay, and we say that you know there are 100 people in society, so everyone's going to have a number from 1 to 100. And if Mobility hasn't changed and everyone, whatever movement there is, it doesn't get bigger or smaller. But the problem is, think of it as a ladder with, with five or ten steps on the ladder. And if you stay at the bottom of the ladder or stay at the top of the ladder, that's one thing. And if it changes over time or not, that's another thing. But the ladder keeps getting, the rungs in the ladder keep getting wider and wider. So the costs of being stuck in the bottom, or the benefits of being stuck or 
born into the top and staying in the top are much bigger now. So the consequences are much different. So that's another issue we'll talk about. Now, I don't like that. This, I think too much time is spent on this. This is all history, okay? It's all history. Who cares if I'm better off than my father was or that my 38-year-old son, uh, Ryan, who's almost old enough to measure his status, um, is doing pretty well in life, although not as well as his father and so forth. That's all history. What you want to know is, do you have an acceptable level of mobility in your society, yes or no? And if the answer is no, then what you want to say is, what can we do about it? And the developmental approach, way two, is to look at children and families and find out what's important in promoting, promoting mobility, and then asking, do children have these opportunities? What kind of families are children growing up in? What kind of neighborhoods are children living in? Do children have an equal opportunity to go to college or university? And so forth. Now, that are the sorts of questions a society should be asking because that guides policy now. So you're in Luxembourg, you say, what are we doing for our children? When I left in 2000, the middle 2000s, the Portuguese didn't want to go to school because they just didn't want to go to school. Well, at some point, selling vegetables and, and fruits is not going to pay off at some point. There should be more opportunities, okay? There should be a chance to get ahead if you work hard. And so that's something that we're going to talk about in way two. Now when way three is a new method, uh, and new tools for mobility research where what happens is you start with the current generation and you go back and find out about their parents and about their heritage and where they came from and then use that methodology to tell whether the current generation is more mobile or less mobile whether there's more opportunity or less opportunity. So here we go. These are the three ways right here. I just talked about these. Traditional, developmental, and way three. Start now and look back. So those are the three ways I'm going to talk about. Now way one. This is, don't, this is the only equation in the paper. Don't, don't fall out of your seat. Just relax, okay? The usual approach is you have some origin. That's the parents on the right-hand side and their income is Y. And then you have some destination children when they grow up to be adults are on the left. And you say, what is this beta? This beta coefficient says, the higher this beta, the less mobility. If we had a society in which the rankings of one to 100 were the same for parents and their children, everyone stayed exactly where they were in terms of social place, that would be a totally immobile society. There's no mobility. You're born into the top, you stayed at the top. You're born into the bottom, you stayed in the bottom, regardless of any efforts or, that you took. So that's not a good society. So the persistence coefficient, how, how much things persist, is the beta, and one minus the beta is the uh, intergenerational mobility coefficient. Now this is one number, and it's not the only number, and it's not the best number, as I'll explain. Um, because you're not really interested in the averages, there are very few people who are average, what you're interested in is do the people who are born into the top stay in the top, do they have unfair advantages, or do the kids born in the bottom stay there because they have all the disadvantages and none of the advantages? So that, that's, we're going to look at that too. Now, here's the problem. This beta, estimating this beta. Oh, there's huge ranges of outcomes, okay? It depends on the data set you use. It depends on the year and the ages where the fathers or sons and parents or children are observed. Usually the children are observed when they grow up to be 37 or 40. The years over which you average makes a difference. The data quality makes a difference. It makes a difference whether you use earnings or education or wealth or income or consumption to measure mobility. Okay? But almost all the studies show less mobility from the top and the bottom than in the middle. So in other words, there's stickiness in the corners, and those are the, the big issues, okay? Now here's another big problem with the traditional way, and particularly in my country, in the United States. There's two data sets, one called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, and the other called the Nas NL, uh, NLS, National Longitudinal Study. And what they did is they take a sample of adults in the 60s or 70s and then watch their children grow up. But that means anybody who moved to the country after they started the sample is out. There's no immigrants. You know nothing about immigrant mobility from the traditional method. Nothing. Not a thing. Because they're not counted in. 
You took the people in Luxembourg in 1970 and you watched their kids grow up, they're 40 now in 2010, that's great, but unless their kids happen to marry an immigrant, you know nothing about anybody who came after the panel started, because that's the problem with uh, the panel. The good news and the bad news about a panel study is you follow the same people for year after year after year. So there's nothing there. And another important part in America in particular is uh, we're the world's leaders in lots of things, not all of them wonderful, uh, most of them not, and incarceration is the big one. So we take people who would be unemployed or hanging around the bus station uh, or the train station in Luxembourg City and we lock them up and institutionalize them and then leave the data set. So they're not even there, so you can't even find them. So these are a couple of the problems with the usual view. Now, here's part of the problem. Look at the ranges. I mean, these, these, this is the 90% confidence interval. And some countries it's pretty small. That's Norway and Sweden because they have wonderful administrative data, which I'm going to tell you to use later, public administrative data to measure mobility, okay? And then others like the United States, it's huge, huge. Brazil is small range, but that's just, I mean, one number. So the trouble is the pattern isn't so clear that if you just looked at the red dots, you'd see a pretty good line. But if you took account of the confidence intervals, it didn't do too well. Here's another look at the same thing. This is from a book I did called From Parents to Children with Marcus Yanti and, Andrews, uh, and Robert Erickson. No. Remember who I did that? Ah, John Ermish, I'm sorry. He's a, uh, and what you find is that, you know, in some relatively high, these are high, in, high inequality, at least parental inequality, uh, and low mobility countries. France, God forbid. Italy, God forbid, in the United States. But the Canadians and the Australians have almost as much inequality, but a lot more mobility. So their inequality is about the same, but their persistence coefficient is much less. Look at Germany and Denmark. Inequality is about the same, but Denmark's a much more mobile society than Germany. And these countries, the Scandinavian countries, have, tend to have low inequality and high mobility. Now, you might have heard of this the Gatsby curve. This was made famous by Maus Korak. He said, look, I'm going to take one number, no ranges, no, no, no confidence intervals, and here's a line that plots inequality there against mobility, or the lack of mobility. Now, you know, these, what you have here is a correlation. You don't have causation. The first important thing to know, okay? Does the fact that we have more inequality cause more, less mobility or not? And the second thing is it doesn't line up so well, particularly if you take the countries which, where we don't really have very good data and throw them out. Anyway, this, is, this has spawned a whole bunch of arguments about the relationship between inequality and mobility, a whole bunch of them. And I'll talk about some of them as we go forward. So what? Inequality and mobility are related, but there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. I just mentioned the second point already. I mentioned the third point, and so the Gatsby curve needs some confidence intervals. Uh, you can, by the way, you can all have the PowerPoint. You can write to me about various papers and things I've done. Now, here's another big argument in the United States. Have you heard? If you've studied or know about mobility, you know the name Raj Chetty. Very smart guy. Took all this data, and claims that many people in America, including me, believe that mobility has fallen. We believe that, the, that when I was a kid, I had a better chance of moving up than do kids today who come from where I came from, the lower middle class family, a working family, have a le lesser chance. I believe that. He said, oh, the data doesn't show that. Well, let's look at how he did this, okay? So he says that this, all the way, he says, if you were born from 1967 all the way up to 1993, okay, that there's no change in mobility. You're just as likely in 93 as in 67 to do better or worse than your father. Wait a minute. If you're born in 1993, how old are you now? 22. How can you tell that a 22-year-old, what a 22-year-old's future economic status is going to be? How can, can you, anybody up there got a 22-year-old? I have a 25-year-old and a 23-year-old, and I have no idea where they're going to end up when they grow up. 
But Raj thinks he knows. So what he does is he measures your destination, actually he measures it at age 30, but then he projects it from everybody else. So here's what he says. He says, when we looked at the data, we were surprised. The children's odds are the same. My gosh, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Well, that's because he had data that goes from here to here. And then after that, that line gets really straight, doesn't it? He projects it. He's, this is his words. For children born 936, estimates are based on income at age 26. After 86, estimates are predictions based on whether they went to college or not. What? How can you do this? How can, you, how can this be such a famous guy? Now, the first thing is you've got to get at least age 35 or 40. No one believes this. Chetty uses 30. Okay. Age 40 is better to find out how an adult does, but in the United States, there's good evidence that income peaks at age 50. Okay? And you'll see in a minute that the peak is much higher for the rich. Okay? And you'll see if I look at the difference across people at age 30 in a minute and then at age 50, you're going to see big differences. Okay? And so if these two work, if education and parental income status are correlated, and they are, um, then you're going to underestimate how much mobility. You're going to overestimate mobility and underestimate stasis. And so here's, here's this very funny. He wrote this paper with a guy at the U.S. Treasury Department named Nick Turner. Okay? Nick Turner also wrote this paper, the same paper, this different paper, which disproves Chetty. So what if you looked at status, how close are those together? This is incomes in 2007, adjusted gross income at the 95th, 90th, 75th, the median, and so forth. Well, your income at age 30 is a pretty good estimate for people at the median and below. What a working man is making in 1930 is a good estimate of what he or she is always going to make, right? But what about if you're near the top of the distribution? That is nowhere near the peak up there. That is nowhere near the peak up there. So you're going to underestimate, this is very compressed, you underestimate tremendously intergenerational mobility if you measure it at age 30, and even worse if you measure it at age 21. So that's my problem with, with Raj. He and I know we've argued this before, okay? So here's the problem. In the United States and in most of rich Europe, things were pretty even until about 1980, till the 1980s. All the votes rose the same, okay? But then after 1980, things changed. We had more and more and more inequality. And the trouble is, if you were born after 1980, 1985, you're not even 40 yet, okay? So if you want to know how the inequality really affected children, what you really want to know is where they're going to be when they're 40. But we're not going to know that until 2025 or something. That, that just, that doesn't going to work. And besides that, in a minute, I'll argue, what do we learn from that? So anyway, I'm going to go on to these other two ways. So another important question, of course, is a beta enough, a one number. No, it's not. A one number, the Gini coefficient is the same thing. It's a one number summary of inequality. And it doesn't capture the stickiness at the bottom or the top. So in the United States, depending on which data set you look at, 36 to 40 percent of those whose parents were in the bottom quintile, in the bottom fifth, end up in the bottom fifth. If it were a completely fair society, there'd be 20 percent in the bottom, 20 percent in all the other ones, right? It'd be 20, 20, 20 everywhere. So 40 percent is twice as many people stuck in the bottom as should be, okay? And the numbers at the top are not much better. In other words, there's much, at least 35 percent who are start out in the top quintile end up in the top quintile, okay? Now, but here's the issue, the, the rungs in the ladder. Okay, let's, you can tell me whether mobility has gone up or, or not. What I want to argue is that the rungs of the ladder, the points, the people at the bottom and at the top are in increasingly different positions today than they were back in the 80s. There's been a huge increase in inequality. So the stakes of ending up at the bottom or being at the top are much, much bigger. Okay? And in fact, that's why I think mobility in the United States is too low compared to other nations and compared to anybody's normative standards. 
And it may be falling as we look forward, as I'll show you. Okay? So, moral of my story about way one, looking back is not always a good guide to the future and not a good guide to policy to increase mobility today. So, here's a look at the gaps. This is real income in the United States using the best source, the Congressional Budget Office, only for households with children. Okay? Now, what's happened is 40% of the children. If you look at the bottom 40%, not the bottom 20%, 60% of the children who started out in the bottom 40 stay there. And it's the opposite. At the top end, if you look at the 100th and 80th percentiles, the top 40%, 60% of 65% stay there. So there's a lot of stickiness in the tails, okay? That's, that's the point. So how far apart are the tails? And we're going to look at that right now. Okay, and you'll learn that it's not only relative mobility, it's absolute mobility. Because if you've read any newspapers, you read everywhere that everyone's interested, the World Bank, everyone's interested in the bottom 40%. And something they call inclusive prosperity, or they call it shared prosperity, or inclusive growth. These are all words that the OECD and other people use to talk about whether growth is widely shared. Because if all the economic growth in the country goes to the top 5 or 10%, that's not a very fair society, and that society is not going to have a lot of opportunity. Okay. So here we go. This is a real income for children. Here's the bottom quintile. They had 29. They were down here below, or about 25,000 in 1979. They went up a little bit. The middle is here. The middle and the bottom, the middle moved up a little bit better than the bottom, but not much. But look what happened at the top. The gap between the top and the bottom, which was $98,000 in 79, is now $211,000. It's more than twice as much. In real terms. In real terms, only for families with children. So if families with children at the top of the U.S. distribution have twice as much income as do families at the bottom. Twice as much. Okay? The gap is huge. Okay. Now, Part of the issue is it isn't just the bottom, as you can see. You look at the middle. The middle is not making a lot of progress. All the progress is going on up here at the very top. So the top end is pulling away from the rest. And part of the issue in the middle in the United States is real, the middle incomes in the United States have actually fallen since 2008 in real terms. So you're leaving the middle class behind, the top is running away. That, that society, the question is, is that going to have any impact on kids' chances, and I'm going to argue it does and show you how. Okay, so the middle family is losing. On the bottom of the growth, this data actually includes the value of health insurance as income. Don't ask. Americans do this. There are only people in the world that do this, and I think it's totally stupid. But half of the gap, half of that gain, as small as it is in the bottom, comes from the fact that health insurance costs more. So the card you've got in your pocket that covers you for health insurance costs more. It's, it's totally stupid. I was at a conference in, in in Madrid, and there were people, researchers, who do the same things that Chita and I do from all over the world. And I said, does anybody in any country include the value of health insurance in your income measure? Please stand up. No one stood up. So it's stupid, but the rest of the data is really good, so that's why we do it. And the middle is falling, which really hurts, so this is why the middle class in America, this is why this election we're having is about the middle class. They're not getting anywhere. They're doing the right things. And they're afraid their kids won't have the same chance as they did. And almost two-thirds of American parents believe that their children won't be better off than they were, which is foreign to Americans. I mean, totally foreign. And this is the issue. Now, here's what's happened to wages. What's behind income? Mainly for many people, wages. So this is David Otter's article in Science in, in May, and I recommend it to you if you want to understand. These are full-time earners. These are men. These are women. And you can see that the men, the men who have only a high school degree or less, have sunk. They've gone down. Without something beyond a high school degree, in my best friends, you're screwed, okay, in the United States. Even with a bachelor's degree, though, things have been pretty flat since 2000. The only people who are doing better and better are those with postgraduate degree among men. Now, among women, it's a little bit brighter. Women, yahoo! Women are much more mobile. Their, their incomes are generally rising. It's still pretty flat and pretty low 
at the high school dropout in the high school level, even their incomes have been falling. So this is wages. Now, here's to show you quickly how, why family is important, okay? There's something called a sort of mating. What that means is that if you develop a partnership or a marriage to somebody, it's generally somebody you met in the same university or in the same job or the same place where you are or in the same neighborhood, okay? Okay? So if we have a sort of mating, then we take two people who've got PhDs or two people who have bachelor's degrees and family income is twice this. It's, a, it's the blue line plus the blue line or the yellow line plus the yellow line. That adds up to a lot, right? Now what happens if you're a single mother or a single parent? Where are you? Well, there's no guy over here to count on. So here you are as a single mother with a low income, okay? So the, the process of marriage and stability and so forth also is going, to, is going to make a difference here. And in the end, I think I've said this before, way number one is a poor guy for policy. Uh, who cares about this debate? There's concern to bring the bottom up and to improve mobility at the bottom. And so the question is, what can we do to make the next generation better off? Now, the old research isn't totally useless because what we can do is get some parameters from that data and look at what's happened to children and the way children have progressed over time, including the current. So this is a life course approach. This is the way too, the developmental way, okay? Um, I'm going to show you a model, the CRETA model, uh, that's from our book that uh, we do a lot of cross-national work with it. Then we're going to look at the USA social genome model, and we're going to say how well the kids do. So here's the model. It's just a picture. Here are children. They go through all these stages when they grow up. They're born somewhere. They have an early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, and they end up as adults. So this is the exact same process I talked about before. Now these kids go through all these stages, and their stages are guided by both investments and institutions, okay? The institutions in a country which provide, you know, things like early childhood education or good health care and so forth, and investments that are made in their schooling by their parents and by them, all right? So this is the model, and it's simple. And what we did is we went out and used this model and applied it across 11 countries and 35 data sets, and anywhere we could, we, we, we compared things as best we could. And what we found is we took parents' education, which you've got in every data set, we said if you're, suppose you're a child of a low, a middle, or a highly educated parent, okay? Where do you, how do you do on everything from birth weight to the first time anybody measured um, your cognitive or your behavioral outcomes when you were in first grade, all the standardized testing to whether you went to college, every measure you can think of. And what we find in every single measure is if your parent had a higher education, you did better. And if your parent had a lower education, you did worse. And there was a, so there's a slope in every country which differentiates between how well people do or don't. We also use income in a lot of these and so forth. And what you find is there's a gap between the kids who were born lucky and the kids who were born unlucky in health, cognitive, and behavioral domains right from the start, from the first to first start. There's some influence of parenting, heredity, environment, including inter-utero environment and genes. And it's especially large for boys versus girls. So for boys, it's much worse for boys to be born into a low-end family than it is for girls. And it's much better for boys to be born in a high-end family than for girls. And in no country do we find that people start out equally. So the idea that there's equal opportunity, it's just not there. But the slopes are very different. And you can make some differences. Okay, and we're going to look at some of those. So here's one. Here's vocabulary score at age five across four different countries. Okay, there's a new book from Russell Sage done by Jane Walfogel, which actually builds on this. I put this team together five years ago to do this book. Now they have their own book about everything, about all stages. But look at the top of the line is how well the top quartile kids do, and the bottom is how well the bottom kids do. Canada's got a very small range. Remember their inequality was about the same as U.S., but they have a very small range, which means that there are not a lot of outliers. The, the kids at the bottom do better than do the kids at the bottom, let's say, in Australia, in the U.K., and especially the U.S., where the U.S. is being the king of inequality. At the very top, 
some do very well, and at the very bottom, some do very badly. So this is an example. This is exactly what I said. These are the differences on how well you do by parental education. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, I mean, if, if there were no differences, they'd, there'd be really tight little, there'd be tight little areas that are just random noise around that line. But there are differences. And they persist. So here's differences at test scores of ages 11 to 17 by parents' ed education. This is from PISA. And it's the same picture. You see that the very, the very top, if you do well, you do really well, but the bottom is different. Now, Germany is a strange case because of their tracking system. They put a lot of people into early on. They said, you're not going to, you're, you're not going to gymnasium. You're not going to go on to university. You're going to go into an apprenticeship program. Uh, but the last thing I'd want to be today is a 20-year-old, 25-year-old German in an apprenticeship program because they just can't pay off the way they, they did in the past. There's too much foreign competition. It's really difficult to make a living with your hands in, in Germany or in any country today. Um, it takes more, more than a high school degree. It takes more than on-the-job training. It takes mathematics. It takes being able to run a computer and so forth. So, but you see the exact same thing, all these differences. And they look a little bit bigger now than they did before as well. So this is a lot of cost. We did this time and again in our book. Now here's the United States equivalent of this. I drew a big picture. They just said, OK, let's look at life stages. You're going to go from birth to the middle class. That means income's three times the median. That, that gets you in above the 60th percentile, or 300 percent of poverty, I'm sorry, which gets you somewhere around $65,000, $70,000 a year. Not a lot, but middle class in America, OK? Uh, you have to be born in a normal birth rate to a non-poor married mother who has at least a high school diploma. Right there, the United States falls flat in its face, as I will show you, OK? You have to get acceptable preparation for formal schooling. In other words, you have to go to preschool, as kids in France do and other places, and get ready for schooling. Uh, you have to add your basic skills as you go through schooling, learning things and, and hitting the levels that you're supposed to. Uh, you have to graduate from high school with a reasonable uh, GPA and not be convicted of a crime. Uh, and you have to live independently with some sort of post-secondary degree, something beyond the bachelor's degree, whether it's a technical degree or a four-year degree or so forth. And if you have all that, you're going to reach middle class. Now, you don't have to jump over all of these hurdles. Sometimes you can miss one. But the more you miss, the harder it gets to get there. So we know what's going on. What we can learn from this approach is the following. These are the key things. Parents and family structure early in life are really important. If you're born to an 18-year-old mother who doesn't have an education, you're much worse off than, here's the example. Here's, every parent wants the following. You want your son or daughter to go to school and graduate, to get a job, to meet a partner, to make a plan with that partner, and then have a baby. But now take have a baby and put it back at the beginning. Have a baby before you finished school, before you had a job, before you had a partner, and you never had a plan. It is really hard for those kids to be successful. They need an awful lot of help, OK? And so birth conditions, age, there's all these other things that fit in. Money is important. And not just income, wealth, consumption, so forth. I'll show you this. Uh, there's, I'll show you what we call the private safety net and the glass floor. Uh, then there are social institutions that are important. Education and health care. The stronger the social institutions, the more inclusive they are, the better off, the better chances kids have. And then there's the role of place. If you live in a bad neighborhood with a lot of crime and bad schools, that amplifies the bad stuff you got from being born in the wrong side of the tracks. And if you live in lovely Limpertsburg or can afford to live here, and the schools are nice in Lim Limpertsburg, and none of those that riffraff that hangs around the hangs around the train station, is loud in Limpertsburg, and it's lovely and safe, you're going to do much better. OK? So neighborhood matters, too. Right. So the first step is birth status and family stability. US is not going to look good here. Our marker is marriage. People, oh, we don't have marriage. We have cohabitation. That's very stable. It is. We'll take a look at how stable that is, OK? 
Europe is not doing much better even if you have more cohabitation, but the thing that Europe has is some cushions. So for instance, one of the studies, that I may not get to this at the end of the talk, one of the papers that was in our book was done by Arnaud Lafranc, and he looked at Ecole Maternelle, universal preschool in France. It turns out that Ecole Maternelle flattened the gradient between high and low educated parents. It didn't get rid of the gradient, but it made it flatter. And so if you can make gradients flatter, you're improving opportunities. So if you make a difference between a high-end kid and a low-end kid smaller, you're doing better. So the first step in all steps is parents' money and skills. I'm going to assert that virtually every parent wants to do everything they can for their children. The problem is, or the good news is, some of us are much more able to give our children every sort of advantage we can. We understand that, uh, for instance, when I talk to an audience that's highly educated, I say, and how many people in the audience here thought, did, thought their children were not going to college from conception, forget from birth? Oh no, are, are kids going to college? Well, half the kids in America and a huge proportion in other countries don't know this. Their parents aren't sure about this, so they don't steer them in the right way right off the bat to get going. And I'll show you some of the other things that happen. And so there's big differences between spending in kids' enrichment and activities. It's not just money. It's reading to your child. It's getting them out from in front of the television. It's talking with your child. Uh, things that have to do with one-on-one, -on -one improving, you know, interacting with them and showing them that there's something other than being parked in front of a television set as a way to live, okay? It's the ability, can, can you imagine going to school and arguing with a teacher? When the teacher says, and what grade did you get through? And you say, well, I didn't graduate college, or I barely got out of, or, excuse me, I didn't graduate high school, or I barely got out of secondary school? She just said, well, what do you know about what I'm doing with your child? Well, that's really difficult to go in and make that argument. If you go in as hair doctor professor, on the other hand, and you say, hey, what's going on with Johnny or Jimmy here? Oh, yes, sir, yeah, well, 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 you get a lot more attention. So part of it is that, too. So here's unmarried births in the United States as a percent of all births. Right now, over 40% of births in the United States are to unmarried parents. Oh, they're cohabiting. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Among African Americans and blacks, it's much higher. Um, among white Anglos, it's still pretty high, you know, all the way up to 35%. So the first step was getting born to a married parent. Uh-oh, we're not doing well there. Now. The United States is not the world leader in unmarried births. Icebox people, Swedes, Norway, France, Denmark, United Kingdom, all have higher fractions of kids born out of wedlock. But the people say, ah, wait a minute. They're in cohabitation. They don't call it marriage. They're not married. But they have some sort of a long-term arrangement that's more, more permanent. Oh, really? How permanent is it? You're going to hear a lot more about this from my wife tomorrow, by the way, at, at, at that stuff. She really knows this stuff very well. So you see marriage dropping in the United States, continuing to drop. Marriage hasn't dropped as much among older, better educated people, but it has among everybody else. And as Charles Murray's book shows, this is not African Americans and it is not Latinos, these are white Anglos. Marriage rates in the 20s are dropping like a stone for white Anglo kids, middle class kids. They're not getting married. They're having kids, but they're not getting married. And you can see that unmarried births are much higher among those with the le least education. Unmarried births among college graduates haven't moved up much at all. Still less than 10%. If you talk about never married, never married ever, ever, never, not just not married when you had the kid, which was on the last chart, again, you see that only 3% of highly educated parents, okay, were never married. Look at the fractions of others lesser educated. So this is a big problem. You don't have a partner. This is not good. Okay? So now let's look at Europe. If you think America looks bad, there's still a much higher proportion of low educated unmarried parents in these other countries who have children out of wedlock. Okay? The ratio is not as big as the United States, but there's still a lot of them, UK, France, and so forth. Now, how many children have unstable relationships? This is even as bad. A kid grows up in a situation where, where 
the parents don't stay together. So there's this lovely survey that says, by age 15, I don't care if you call yourself married, living together, fighting all the time, whatever, if both parents are present until age 15, you're not counted here. But look at the numbers in each of these countries whose parents have split up by age 15. 58% in France, okay? 38% in Sweden, 43% in Australia. Austria, I'm sorry. Italy, they stay married when they get married. Congratulations, the Italian army over here, okay. Okay, and instability leads to this complexity. My wife will talk to me about something called multi-partner fertility. That means if in the United States, if you take an unmarried mother and an unmarried father and they have a biological child, okay? If neither of those parents have more than a high school degree, the chances that one or another will have another child with another partner out of wedlock are 65%. So that means all kinds of stepkids and kids, and this is his father, this is her father, this is here, this is there. And these are, so look at how many parents enter a new union within six years, okay? And then finally, Look at the percentage who have children with two or more fathers. The United States doesn't look so sticking out anymore because the Australians and Norwegians. Okay, so there's this whole thing that, you know, he's his father over there, her father's over there, I've got the two of them, I'm trying to balance the two of them off, neither one of them are paying the child support, they don't want to pay for each other's kids, and it's a real mess. This does not produce good kids. This does not get kids on track, so that's a problem. Now, how about literacy? These are how often do you directly interact in literacy activities, reading to your child or speaking with your child. And it's all relative to the top quintile, which isn't there. So what you can see is that the people at the bottom are much, much, much less, increasingly less likely to interact with their kids as their kids grow up. So if you don't talk to your kid and you don't read to your kid, they don't do well. Full stop. That worldwide, everyone knows that. So the bottom line is that strong parents matter all the way to adulthood. So I've, I'm, here's just, I want to move ahead more quickly here. How long do I have? Till 7? 7.15? Good. In the morning? Or 7.15 tonight or 7.15 tomorrow morning? Which now? Okay. okay. Uh, so here's parenting quality at these genome life stages. So if you're rated as a weak parent, those are the light blue lines, at each of these stages, at each of these, each of these points where you measure how well a kid is doing, you do worse than if you're a strong parent. This is always the house clean, you read to your kids, is there a lot of junk around, and so forth and so on. So parents matter, so that's one thing. But now I want to convince you that money matters too, and it does matter, and it's not just income. I'm going to talk about new work I'm doing on the demography of inequality. This has what happens is when you look at children and you look at economic status, there's at least three things we can look at. One is called consumption. How much does a family spend? How many goods and services do they consume, including the flow value of durables and so forth? Another one is income. We all talk about income. That's a flow value. But then the third one is wealth. What's the net worth of your family household? Okay? And what I'm going to show you is that if you rank everyone in each data set by overall income, then overall consumption, overall wealth, if everything were equally distributed, it would be 20%, there would be, everyone be at 20%, right? But if they're not, then you find out disproportionately who's coming from a low wealth family, or a low consumption family, or a low income family, as well as the other end. No one's done this before. This is all using the same data set, uh, and this is the work I'm doing on doing this year. So start with age. We're going to look at children and their parents. The children's incomes and wealth are going to be me measured by their parents' incomes and wealth and their consumption by their household consumption. Then adults and then elders. Now, look at that picture. What you find is that adults, well, they tend to be mainly, adults alone tend to be moving up here pretty good. And up in terms of income, the elderly are really don't look good in terms of income. They really don't. They're down at the bottom. Children are down at the bottom, too. So these adults, single adults, be whatever, they're, they're doing much better. But look at what happens when you look at wealth. 
or consumption. Wait a minute. The elderly are doing much better. How do they all get up there at the top? If their income's so low, how do they get up there at the top? It's simple. They spend out of their wealth. So you can't just look at one index and tell what's going on. You can't just look at income. You have to look at consumption and, in particular, I'm going to argue wealth. Look at children. They do worse off, many more in the bottom end relative to in consumption terms, and also poorly off overrepresented and above the 20% line in terms of wealth. So children are at the bottom of the wealth. There's more children at the bottom of the wealth distribution than at the bottom of the consumption distribution than at the bottom of the income distribution. So does this matter? We'll see. Now I'm going to look at some of those groups who didn't get ahead who we talked about before. I'm going to talk about minorities, especially blacks, quickly, single parents and unstable families, and the least educated, and those who didn't get through secondary school. So look at that. Huh. In every one of those pictures, you don't need to squint a lot to tell what side of the line they're on. They're completely disproportionately piled up at the bottom of the income pile for blacks, consumption and wealth. Single parents, not some of them doing okay in income, but bad in consumption, really bad in wealth. And high school dropouts, bad, bad, bad. So these three things mean no income, no consumption, no wealth. Now, in a society which has a strong social safety net and strong social supports, it doesn't matter as much. But in America, it makes a huge amount of difference, okay? A huge amount of difference where you are. So does everyone understand what I'm doing? Uh, these are the 20, the percent, each bar is for a quintile. Uh, the quintiles are ordered overall by income, consumption, and wealth. So if everyone was equally well off, there'd be 20% in all the distributions, okay? All right? But some people are more likely to be at the top and others at the bottom. What I've shown you here in this picture are those who are more likely to be at the bottom. So if blacks or single parents or high school dropouts were doing better, there'd be many fewer of them at the bottom, more in the middle, and more at the top, okay? Here. Go back here. This is important. We only rank each one once. And if there are 20%, if the 20% line is the important line, if an equal, a completely equal society would have 20, would be 20, 20, 20, all the bars would be at 20%, okay? But they're not, because some are more likely to be at the top, and others are more likely to be at the bottom. So this is just where you are in the distribution. Now I can send you a paper, send me an email, it'll be at the end, and I can send you a paper where we can look at white married people, and you can look at college graduates and you'll find the exact opposite picture. In other words, all, they are all, whoops, they are all up here at the top of these. They look more like the elderly here in terms of wealth and income and consumption. Okay. So what you find from here is there's relatively few kids who are really well off, who are up in, you know, up in a high wealth area or in a high consumption, in a high income area, and many more kids who are near the bottom. These kids are going to have a harder time. Louis? Is this in terms of equivalized income and consumption? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's equivalized, yes. And as a paper I did with some woman named Eva Sherminska sitting next to you, uh, the equivalent scales don't matter a lot for wealth. All right. Okay? So here we go. Now, what else besides income matters? You've seen in the pictures that most children are concentrated in low consumption and wealth quintiles, even more than in income. And that means there's fewer advantaged kids. There are fewer high wealth, high consumption kids and more disadvantaged kids. And I'm going to show you in a minute what this wealth does. It, pr it, it provides what I call a family safety net or a glass floor at the top of the distribution. Now, elders have high consumption and wealth and low income, so if you just looked at income, you haven't got a very good picture of the elderly at all. And if you looked at income for kids, you find out they're worse off when you look at consumption or wealth. And wealth inequality is widening and it may be the most important. So here's one example. Here's just an example. This is spending. Spending on children's enrichment. Send your kid to summer camp. Put them in an internship program that goes to, goes to some city. Uh, make sure they have great after school care. Buy them music lessons. Uh, Buy them coaches so they do well in standardized exams. And this is the amount that's spent in the United States from 
72 to 2005, 2006, for people at the top of the distribution and people at the bottom. 8,000 bucks a kid, $9,000 a kid versus 1,300 a kid spent on extracurricular activities from the top to the bottom. Oh, that's going to make a difference. It's going to look different on your resume or when you apply to school and so forth. So there's how consumption matters and ability to consume matters. Now, here's the rich kid safety net. Now this is, I've talked to a lot of Europeans about this too when they wiggle and squirm, but they're not far from this. If you're in the top income distribution and wealth distribution, you have your own built-in safety nets for your kids. One I haven't mentioned here, your kid gets in trouble, you know a good lawyer. You, go, you scold a kid, you tell him you can't go smoking again, or you shouldn't have, and, and you can't drive like that while you're drinking, and, and they do okay. If you happen to be an, um, an African American or, a, or, or, or an immigrant in the United States, you get caught like that, and you're in jail. Okay? So the first thing you do, if you're a high income parent, you buy a good home in a safe school district. So in other words, you buy into good schools. In the United States, good neighborhoods have good public schools, bad neighborhoods have bad public schools. And everyone wants to be in the good district, but you can't afford to get into the good district. And it's safer there, and it's nicer there, and the kids are the same, they're much nicer and so forth. In fact, part of the problem in the United States is that the rich live such different lives from the poor that they never cross, they never meet each other. They weren't in the same foxholes in, in the 40s, okay? They weren't even in the same jungle in the 60s when we had the Vietnam War. Uh, but they just don't talk to one another. They're just, just in totally different worlds, okay? The second thing, in the United States, this is important. Tuition, college tuition costs a lot. No child of a well-to-do person I know, including mine, ever had to worry about who's going to pay their tuition or whether they're going to have to go into debt to go to school. A lot of other kids do. Now, you, the, one of the nice things about Europe is when you get ready to go to university, your tuition is much lower, so you've got much less of a problem. But now you graduate from college, and you're here, and if you're, you're living in Mersh or in Dudelange or somewhere, and there's no job there for anybody with a college degree, okay? Where are the jobs? Not in Metz. In Luxembourg. Wait a minute. A middle-class person can't afford to have their kid live in Luxembourg until they find a job. To locate her, ah, mommy and daddy come to the rescue. Same thing happens in the United States. You subsidize your children to be in expensive cities so job mismatch is overcome, so you can get a good opportunity. I have a 25-year-old son, paid his first and last month's rent to live in Boston instead of Syracuse, New York, and he's doing great now because he's in Boston, and I can afford for him to do that. Otherwise, he'd be still living in my basement, and that wouldn't be great, okay, for either one of us, right? Now, here's another one. Help buy a home, okay? So the idea is interest rates are low. Now is the time to buy a house, but wait a minute. This kid doesn't have any good credit history. They don't have a permanent job yet. Uh, no one's going to loan them money to buy a house unless their parents co-sign the mortgage. Ding dong. That happens too. And then the last one, we have a, we have a wonderful paper in the book. The question is the following. How many children end up with their lifetime job in the same firm, the same business that their parents were in? 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10 percent, until you get to the very top of the distribution. And above the 90th percentile, 35 percent in Canada, 30 percent in Denmark, and 25 percent in the USA go to work at the same firm their parents were. But that's only true at the very top end. Okay? So in other words, there's a lot of direct transmission of jobs, not just connections, the family firm, the family business, the, oh, of course, you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor or, or you're going to be a businessman, you're going to join our family firm. This is what happens at the top. It, okay. So this is why wealth is important. Now, there are some numbers. This is very interesting. This is from my financial planning firm. This is a fraction of parents who have ever done any of these things to help their kids. And they're pretty high. The numbers for the general population to do this, if you can't pay your own mortgage, you're not helping your kid pay his mortgage. And you can't help him even get a house and so forth and so on. So it's just a small sample, but... Okay. 
So now let's go back to the Gatsby question. Inequality and mobility, which one drives the other? Does inequality affect intergenerational mobility? Yes, I've shown you time and again. It makes a big difference, okay? Do factors that affect IGM, such as changes in the economy, favoring more education, family compliance, blah, 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 affect? Yes, they do, okay? So the problem is that inequality can affect mobility, but if you're born to a single parent and growing up with a single parent in a low-income family, that's going to make inequality bigger. So the two interact with one another. Parents are with out of wedlock births at younger ages, live in complex families, have less education, poor economic outcomes, live in worse neighborhoods, and that increases inequality, right? So it's not just one way. It's not that more inequality here means bad news. There's this guys in England, uh, Pickett, and, Pickett and Wilkinson, inequality causes everything. That guy's picture, his jaw's not straight because of inequality. Uh, that button's red because of inequality. Uh, we have more teenage pregnancy because of inequality. Uh, inequality is the source of everything. Well, my, <laughs> it's not. Some inequalities are good. Inequalities, if the chances are fair in society, then the inequalities you get are okay. But the chances aren't fair. That's my problem. So most all the ingredients are affected by parental inequality and the trend in development, all those trends in development I looked at don't look good for the kids who are at the bottom to get ahead. And even if you think that, well, the chances are the same, the outcomes of being at the top or being at the bottom are much, much different now. The stakes are much bigger. Getting stuck at the bottom really isn't good, and being at the top is really good. Okay? Now, a better way is to try and use surge, this is for you, to use administrative data uh, to build a social mobility architecture or a mini registry so that, in fact, you wouldn't have to ask people in surveys what their earnings were. You could just go to Remy, the Social Security Administration, and get their earnings directly from there. Exact, from Remy, not from you, sir, from Remy, right? But you could also look at various other records, and you didn't have to ask these in surveys. Now, surveys are still important because you don't get everything from registers. So this is something that I just got done, done working on called the American Opportunity Study. And there's the, this is the annals, this is January annals, and it's about the American Opportunity Study. I'm one of the co-editors of this. And here's what we want to do. The top row, the light blue, are the U.S. censuses. Every year, just as they did in the days of Jesus, every year, every 10 years, people fill out a form and say, here's, this is who I'm living with, and this is who I'm related to, and this is my occupation, and so forth, okay? So for every person in America who's my age, which is 67, I have been in six different censuses. I was in a census as a son for a few times, as an independent for a few times, but I'm, every 10 years, you can find me in these censuses, okay? That's important. Now, what we do is you take these censuses, these, we're going to take these censuses, we're going to take these people who are in a survey or a study, and we're going to ask their permission, and then we're going to go to a census and find out everything we can about their parents and about them. And then when we found this out from the census, we're going to link it to administrative records, like, Rem like Remy Wagner's Social Security records, and other administrative data, Veterans Administration, medical care, health, in income, so forth and so on. So in other words, we're going to make links directly, so we don't have to ask people what their parents did. If I ask you, when you're, if I ask you how much did your, did your parents make when you were 15, you'd have no idea, okay? No idea. But if you give me permission, I can find out when you were 15 how much your parents were making. So that's the point of this. And this is happening all over the world. The OECD is interested in this. The United Kingdom's got a big study commission on it. The idea is the data is there. Now, people say, wait a minute, you're going to invade my privacy. That's an issue. But this can be done in a way that does not compromise privacy. And it's a much better way to get evidence on how well people are doing. So the key is something called a PIC, a personal identification key. So you're in one of these surveys, and you, you're, you say, when I was 15, I lived in Lippertsburg. Uh, my mother's name was Gaston, my father's name was Gaston Chabert, and my mother's name was Marie-Paul Chabert. And um, he was a 
professor, and she was a homemaker. So you go. Given that information, you can go and find out where this guy Shaber and what his daughters and where his daughters are uh, because we know something about the parents. So instead of going to a parent generation, remember way one and watching the kids grow up, we could take people who are here now and go back and find their parents. That tells you everybody who's here now what they did. Oh, what about immigrants? That's good. If the kids' parents didn't show up in the censuses, they're immigrants. You need to find out what year they came and so forth, okay? And then you get this identification number and you link it to the, to the um, data and then you put your study in the middle. So this is what Chetty, all Chetty's work is done by parents and kids using tax records. All those big pictures, it's all using administrative data, okay? So with permission to link, you can look back at parents or grandparents and, and the current generation. You can look at the children and grandchildren of the current generation, okay? You can take an older sample and find out. So suppose you had these 25 kids who were the first kids who were in preschool in Luxembourg in 1972. They're adults now, okay? You can identify them and say, how well did they do versus the kids who didn't go to that preschool? And with complete accuracy, or certainly much better accuracy. Stop? I gotta stop. Okay. Anyway, you can do these things. So, finally, see? What to do about it? You have to be modest. Here's the big problem. Is anybody in this room going to tell a high-end parent, or any parent, that they can't do everything they can for their children? Absolutely not. It's impolitic, it's inefficient, it's crazy. So telling a parent you can't do everything you can to make your kid better off isn't going to work. So what you have to do is to help the kids at the bottom who don't have such lucky parents try and get ahead. And there are things, a whole list of them, that I'm not going to go into right now that you could do, okay? But there's limits to those policies because the parents at the top don't want competition for their kids. They know there's so many seats at, in England at the top five universities. Or there are so many seats in the... In the in, the Ivy League schools in the United States, and my kid's gonna get one of those, and I don't want some smart kid who came from a poor family to take my kid's spot in that university. It's human nature, in some sense. So you have to be careful. It's really hard to limit what a parent can do for their children, but you can level a playing field by giving some of the same opportunities for education, health, and advancement to kids at the bottom, and that's what we should do. Okay. And those are the steps. We're not going to talk about those. So, I can't for the life of me see how mobility can be even constant, much less increasing. It's got to be less mobile society. With all those increases in single parenthood, all those increases in inequality, all those increases in what people are spending on their kids, all the things that people at the top can do for their kids that people at the bottom can't, all of those are big and they're increasing. So how can you say that mobility is the same? It's not the same. The next generation is not going to be as well off. And I've argued in a couple of places that unequal opportunity and falling mobility are the biggest negative social outcome in the American inequality boom, and maybe in Europe too. Okay, the inequality boom in income, neighborhoods, wealth, and parenting. Thanks. Ask me some questions. Let me clarify what I, what I didn't do. There's my email. I answer it virtually, certainly within a day. If you want to read a paper, if you want to talk about any of this stuff, let me know. I'll send you the evidence. I've got lots of stuff for you to read. Strangers in the night.